Good morning. Morning. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. Do you guys still have snow? Just a little bit. It, the sun came out yesterday, so it melted a lot of it, but there's still a bit on the ground. That's so nice. <laughs> yeah. Schools are still out today, so oh, that's wow. interesting. They've had all week. <laughs> oh my goodness. So the parents are probably going, okay, time to go back. Probably so. <laughs> <laughs> time to go back. I know, because they start getting bored. I know. Oh, uh, well. They're, they're going to have to make up all those days. So Yeah. So do you think today they could have gone back? Is it not that bad? Yeah, but there there's some areas in our county that get it a little worse. And yeah. so I'm not sure. It might be still icy in those spots. But yeah, yeah. So that might be why. But yeah, yeah. Huh. Do you guys have hills? Huh? Do you guys have hills or is it pretty flat? Um, it's pretty flat. Yeah, it's pretty flat okay. here. But it's just further north in our county, um, it it usually it can be a big difference between my city and there. So yeah. Well yeah. That's why, huh? Well, that's nice, I guess, for them. One more day. I'll have yeah. a weekend and then Time to go back, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> Less gave Monday sale, regret, rest, card, ready, cut, delay, looking, surely, replying, orders, Ordered, Friday, half, war, between, things, offer, recent, weeks, invoice, promptly, supply, country, indeed, connect, connection, different, where, records, trouble, contract, talk, taking, accept, sincerely, December, express, later, value, November, yes, play, months, took, cold, together, join, when, woman, terms, satisfactory, secretary, members, living. All right, let's do some common phrases. Here we go. Is that the, is that your, is the, is there, is this, is to be, is whether or not, it is, he is, she is, that is, there is, this is, what he is, what is, when is, where he is, where is, whether he is, which he is, which is, who is, it can, it cannot, it could, it feels, it feel, or I'm sorry, it felt, it had, it is, it recalled, it recalls, it should, it was, it shall, it were, it will, <clears throat> it would, it would be, it would have, it would have been, it would have had, jury charge, jury room, gentlemen of the jury, Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, grand jury, members of the jury, just a minute, just a moment. All right. Now I've got a number drill with locations. Here we go. Montana, 4,402. Kentucky, 23,502. Missouri, 12,312. Mississippi, 26,080. Michigan, 146,198. Pennsylvania, 36,082. Louisiana, 36,115. New Jersey, 91,622. Tennessee, 39,110. Nebraska, 3,496, Nevada, 
1,803. Wyoming, 5,108. West Virginia, 6,782. South Dakota, 9,475. Maryland, 6,750. Virginia, 25,903. Oregon, 39,431. Vermont, 1,115. And Rhode Island, 5,183. All right, let's do a theory basic uh, brief review. We've got possible, convenience, convenient, recognize, upon, and particular. Here are your sentences. It is not possible. What is convenient? We recognize the inconvenience. Are you particular about it? Please send full particulars upon receipt of this letter. The store is not conveniently located. Were you recognized? It will depend upon a possible answer. I like the convenience. Richard is adept at recognizing possible problems. It is a matter of convenience. Depend upon it. We want that particular one. We rely upon your suggestion. What are the possibilities? Plan to use that particular one. I recognize them. Is it convenient or not? That would be inconvenient. I recognize the convenience. Don't be so particular. It is a convenience store. He took it upon himself. We could possibly run some tests upon that when it is convenient. That is hardly possible. The possibilities are not pleasant. When would it be convenient to see you upon a matter of particular importance? It has all the conveniences of home. Were you recognized? I think recognizing the problem is half the battle. Mr. Richards is extremely particular. Could you possibly arrange to be here by then? If, if that is not convenient, we could possibly arrange another time, but I particularly want you to give us your advice on these possibilities. You can depend upon our discretion in the matter. We recognize that this is a particularly sensitive issue. It is not convenient to see you today, but it is possible I will have time tomorrow. All right, allergies today, apologize for that. All right, so I've got some sentences that focus on the final FT for ST words, okay? All right, here we go, sorry. All right, here we go, ready? Do you trust him to do the posting? Don't jest about the pest. It is the best paste I have used. Make haste to lower the mast. I trust her to tell the truth. Why don't you protest the decision? The rust forms very fast. Just run as fast as you can. I trust they removed the cyst. I drove from east to west. The rust needs to be removed. Why don't you protest the decision? The letter was posted a week ago. She boasted about her new post. There was heavy mist late last night. I trust the toast is not burned. At least show good taste. He was exhausted after the race. The taste of the drug is bitter. Do I turn east or west when I reach the highway? The test is the least of my worries. Last month we did it in haste, but this time we hired an artist, and I trust it will be a better job. The new ad must be pasted up. I posted the letter yesterday. You should eat the crust on your bread. Houses are more expensive on the coast. These days, somebody is always protesting something. Check the exhaust pipe on the truck. I just heard a funny noise. I do not like the taste of the crust on this, but know that I must not hurt his feelings. Now, these are going to be um, 
words with sentences that have the ST, but they're second, they're two stroke words. Okay, so you come back for ER. Okay, so we have duster, sister, faster, poster, roaster, jester, Easter, fester, pester, plaster, foster, alabaster, master, toaster, caster, coaster. And here are your sentences. I think he saw a ghost. My sister uses a feather duster. Just let me know the answer. Some of these aren't. Don't pester me for a cookie. I know I can master the course. It would be faster to do it my way. John has the role of the court jester. My new shoes rubbed bliz blisters on my heels. The caster came off the chair. The toaster is not working. The twister destroyed the house. I know I can master the course. The statue is alabaster. You need to muster up some strength. East is east and west is west. When is Easter vacation this year? Have you ridden the new roller coaster? Stop pestering me to go faster. So those were mixed with some words that we didn't have to come back for ER. All right, I'm just stating this. So we know we've covered it. All right, <clears throat> let's do some consonant compounds. This focuses on initial consonants SPL. Here we go. He has to splurge when he has money. She spluttered an excuse. They made a splashy appearance. The ring was splendid. You can't explore while you splore. Do you vote a split ticket? I have a splitting headache. See a doctor if you have splenic discomfort. The spline on the screen split. He wore a splint after removing the splinters. He splurged and bought a splashboard Splice the splendid, flimsy film. There was a splotch on his spleen. The split tail made a splash. Split worms do not have split wings. A splash block is needed immediately. She splashed and splashed while swimming. He wore a splendid splint after the accident. Okay. Let's do a few doctors, locations, times, phone numbers. Let's see. Okay. And where they're located. Here we go. Steve Novak, MD, N O V A K, NPI number 01 L3. 10647, located at 080545 Highway 111, Indio, California, 92201. Phone number 760-347-9221. Open from 8.30 to 6, Monday through Friday, 9 to 1 on Saturday, closed on Sundays located at Eisenhower Medical Center, DOC number 10635426367. Ahmed Javed, J-A-V-E-D, M-D, N-P-I number 01C074067, located at 8130 Drive, Carrion Boulevard, Number two, Indio, California, 92201, 760-863-0155. Open from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, 8 to 12 on Saturday, closed on Sundays. Located at John F. Kennedy Memorial Hospital, DOC number 1346, 
5445579. Nancy Lim, L I M M D, and PI number 00C22390-9675 Monte Vista Avenue, Suite B, Montclair, California, 91736. Phone number 909. 457 5054. Hours of operation 10 to 6, Monday through Friday, 10 to 2 on Saturday, closed on Sundays. Located at Montclair Hospital Medical Center, DOC number 127 5060412. And the last one that we have, last two, Nathan McLaughlin. M-C-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N-M-D. NPI number JX2124-4037. Located at 26520 Cactus Avenue, Moreno Valley, California, 92545. Phone number 951-486-4010. Hours of operation, 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, closed Saturday and Sunday. Located at Riverside University Health System Medical Center. DOC number 1104069889. And the last one, Maggie Vahan, V-A-U-G-H-A-N-M-D. MPI number... 01F254756, located at 22575 Alessandro Boulevard, Marino Valley, California, 92523. Phone number 951-571-2350. Hours of operation, 8 to 5.30, Monday through Thursday, 8 to 5 on Friday, Closed on Saturday and Sunday. Located at Riverside Community Hospital. DOC number 1912593-5060. All right. <clears throat> Let's do some Tangle Tamers. Here we go. Massive coronary. Graduating journalism. Underprivileged kids, technical violations, single handedly accomplished, confiscated memorabilia, makeshift parliament, controversial lampoons, progressive specialization, cholesterol screening, outlaw desecration, medical establishment, optimistic outcome, immunodeficiency virus, inactivated HIV virus, traditionally artistic, complementary installation, schizophrenic cynicism, wholeheartedly applauded, entrepreneurial imagination, debunked myths, businesses expanded, commercial newsletters, small business centers, Practical instruction, demonstrated reticence, potential suppliers, award-winning groups, consumer spending, romantic rebound, basically restructuring, <clears throat> towering obstacles, international intrigue, incredibly irksome, pressuring regulators, Racketeering charges. All right. Now my last drill is going to be a word preview list that's going to cover uh, words that you're going to hear in a jury charge. Um, and uh, let's see here. We didn't read, well, yesterday, or I'm sorry, the day before, we read the higher education student aid, but we did not get to the jury charge. 
So we're going to read this. So you're going to hear some of these words in that. And then the other words were from uh, the literary that we already read. But there's, it's still great practice. Because some of these are pretty, I think they're pretty challenging. Okay, here we go. Intimated, accommodate, accommodation, factual, graduate, graduation, affluent, innocence, agricultural, institutions, allocated, apology, intolerable, arbitrary, jurisprudence, assistance, austerity, colleagues, prejudice, prerogative. Did I read these to you? Does that ring a bell, prerogative? Seems like prerogative sounds familiar. Maybe I, see, that's why I always like to date things because maybe I just didn't date it. Maybe I looked over it. But I'll go ahead and continue on because it's still good practice. But when I said prerogative, I'm like, wow, that does sound familiar. Okay, probative, proposals, controversial, commendation, uh, deliberate, demeanor, seizures, subsistence, tuition, undeniably, epilepsy, that rings a bell, erroneous, extravagant, zealously, universities, dissuade. And then as far as the proper names go, you're going to hear campaign tricks, use of CB radios, the Johnstown flood, Mr. Davidson Murtha, Mr. Eric Shuster, Mr. Mendel Davis, Mr. Floyd Courier, Mr. Wilton Gingrich, Federal Income Tax Reduction, United States or United Nations Mid-Decade, Mr. Radford Zablocki, Conference for Women, Mr. Brian Wolf, Wolf Amendment, United Nations Support, Mr. Edward Broomfield, Mrs. Bren Okar, Mr. Victor Witten, Agricultural Rural Development, and appointment of a U.S. delegate to the Conference on Women. All right. So, you know, um, I didn't, oh, you know, I, I think I did read this and I must not have, um, I must not have uh, dated it. So I apologize for that. Huh, usually I date everything. So, okay, all right. So let's go ahead though. And um, there's still more to this. So we're gonna read the insanity part. Um, this can be our jury charge. I'm gonna read this at 200, okay. And this is on insanity. All right, here we go, ready? Insanity, which will excuse somebody from the responsibility of a criminal act is defined in the law as being such a state of mind that a person therein is so far from being in contact with reality that he or she does not know the difference between right and wrong and he or she does not appreciate or know the nature or quality of his or her acts if his or her mental condition is anything other than that or greater than that as far as progressing towards the state of awareness or knowing right from wrong, he or she is not insane as far as the criminal law is concerned. In regards to insanity in the criminal law, any intention by the defendant in regards to being relieved of criminal responsibility by virtue of insanity is an affirmative defense. This means that the defendant must make out this contention by the preponderance of the evidence, not beyond a reasonable doubt, but by the preponderance or greater weight of the evidence. Okay. I have a poem for you. I thought this might be kind of fun. This is called Sick. And then we're gonna do another jury charge as well. I'm gonna mix it up a little. I'm gonna read this at 180 because it is a poem. Okay, all right, I thought this was really cute. Here we go. I cannot go to school today, said little Peggy Ann McKay. I have the measles and the mumps, a gash, a rash, and purple bumps. My mouth is wet, 
My throat is dry. I'm going blind in my right eye. My tonsils are as big as rocks. I've counted 16 chicken pox. And there's one more, that's 17. And don't you think my face looks green? My leg is cut, my eyes are blue. It might be instamatic flu. I cough and sneeze and gasp and choke. I'm sure that my left leg is broke. My hip hurts when I move my chin. My belly button's caving in. My back is wrenched, my ankles sprained. My appendix pains each time it rains. My nose is cold, my toes are numb. I have a sliver in my thumb. My neck is stiff, my voice is weak. I hardly whisper when I speak. My tongue is filled up my mouth. I think my hair is falling out. My elbows bent, my spine ain't straight. My temperature is 108. My brain is shrunk, I cannot hear. There is a hole inside my ear. I have a hangnail and my heart is what? What's that? What's that you say? You say today is Saturday? Goodbye, I'm going out to play. <laughs> I thought that was cute. <laughs> So just out of curiosity, do you find that poems are easier or harder to write? That one I got tripped up in the middle there a little bit, but I started yeah. out pretty okay. Okay. Yeah, I think it's probably a little more challenging. Yeah, yeah, because it's so, uh, you know, rhymey, I'm sure. You want me to read it one more time? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll read, I'll, you want me to read it at 180 again or at 200? Yeah, go up to 200. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. I cannot go to school today, said little Peggy Ann McKay. I have the measles and the mumps, a gash, a rash, and purple bumps. My mouth is wet. My throat is dry. I'm going blind in my right eye. My tonsils are as big as rocks. I've counted 16 chicken pox. And there's one more, that's 17. And don't you think my face looks green? My leg is cut, my eyes are blue. It might be instamatic flu. I cough and sneeze and gasp and choke. I'm sure that my left leg is broke. My hip hurts when I move my chin. My belly button's caving in. My back is wrenched, my ankle's sprained. My appendix pains each time it rains. My nose is cold, my toes are numb. I have a sliver in my thumb. My neck is stiff, my voice is weak. I hardly whisper when I speak. My tongue is filling up my mouth. I think my hair is falling out. My elbows bent. My spine ain't straight. My temperature is 108. My brain is shrunk. I cannot hear. There is a hole inside my ear. I have a hangnail and my heart hurts. And my heart is what? What's that? What's that you say? You say today is Saturday. Goodbye. I'm going out to play. I found a bunch of cute little poems, so I'm going to start reading, like, I'll try to read one each time that we have class. Okay. Now, I've got an article here. I'm only going to read some of it because I know it's going to be really challenging. There's a lot of um, initials in this because it's on road bikes, okay? I'm going to read this at 180. We, we, I read the uh, first part of it about a month, maybe a month and a half ago. So this is the continuation of it. Here we go. Similar to other systems, the SKTRC also features multiple performance modes, although Kawasaki claims that because the system is adaptive, the modes overlap depending on the rider's skill. Level one provides the least intervention with levels two and three progressively more intrusive. The system can also be turned off, which is something that Kawasaki officials encouraged us to try at Road Atlanta. Gathering up enough courage to do so, I made one or two laps with the system turned off before coming to my senses. High siding the XZ10R to the moon may have been ample proof that the system is effective, but I didn't need to go there to be convinced. Besides, I'd already witnessed the system's proficiency. The SKTRC was the showcase technology on the ZX-10R that Kawasaki provided at Road Atlanta. Unfortunately, our test bike was not equipped with the equally intriguing Kawasaki Intelligence anti-locking braking system known as the KIBS. 
which is manufactured by Bosch, to Kawasaki's design specs. Using CAN bus wiring, the KIBS compares information from the front wheel speed sensors, clutch, on-off signal, gear position sensor, engine speed and throttle position to adjust brake pressure. The system is designed to reduce front brake pressure in the event of panic braking or if the rear wheels slows too fast for traction or starts to hop. It is also designed to reduce rear wheel lift under heavy front braking. The ZX-10R's new 998cc inline fours was designed specifically to work with the SKTRC and not merely to shoot for the class horsepower record. Kawasaki claims 200 crankshaft horsepower from the Euro spec machine, but US spec versions are limited by sound compliance. Three power modes allow the rider to choose the level of engine performance, low, medium, and full. The low setting noticeably decreases power, but does not affect the throttle response. Medium and full are similar in their character, although medium does reduce the power at throttle openings below 50%. Above 50% throttle, medium feels a lot like full and unleashes almost all the power that the 10R motor has to offer. The design goal with the new engine, say Kawasaki engineers, was to manage airflow throughout the system and also to reduce mechanical losses and parasitic drag. The former is accomplished via a new, larger airbox with redesigned intake ducts that emphasize mid and high RPM performance. The 10R's new 47 mm throttle bodies also feature larger oval sub-throttle valves designed to increase airflow and improve the throttle control. The system features dual 12-port injectors with a 5-degree wider spray pattern for better fuel atomization. The intake ports retain the same ceiling height as before, but are wider at the valve guides to increase the amount of the incoming air fuel mix, and both the intake and the exhaust ports are polished. The intake valves are increased by 1 millimeter to 31 millimeters, while the exhaust valves remain at 24.5 millimeters. Drag in the new engine is decreased by new 13.0 to 1 compression pistons with 3.5 millimeter shorter skirts and narrower piston rings than the new ride in bores honed with the use of torque plates for more perfectly cylindrical dimensions. Even greater drag reduction was accomplished by offsetting the cylinder 2 millimeters toward the exhaust side from the crankshaft center line, resulting in a claimed 21% reduced piston load and 1.4% less drag at 10,000 RPMs. Beefer, connecting rods, and a new crank with additional stabilizing alloy provide additional strength to withstand its 13,600 RPM red line. The ZX-10R's six-speed cassette style transmission has also been revised with a steeper primary drive ratio at 1.681 versus 1.611 for the 2010 model to optimize the swing arm pivot to chain pull relationship. Because swapping final drive sprockets to change gearing can alter this relationship, creating excessive squat lift Kawasaki is offering no less than seven seven different six-speed gear sets through its parts and accessories division. While expensive, the alternate and alternative ratios should make it easier to tailor the ZX-10R's handling to just about any racetrack without changing these sprockets and all the stock. Although the stock transmission lacks the greasy, slick action, of the S1000RR's electronic gear shift assistant, both upshifting and downshifting are acceptably smooth. <laughs> that was tough to read. I'm sure it was tough to write. 
All right. <laughs> but good practice. My husband has a road bike and he gets these uh, magazines. And I saw this, I'm like, oh, I have to, I've got to mark this for you guys because I figured it'd be good practice. You never know if you might get a, an expert witness that has, you know, something to do with bikes or whatever. So there's about um, half the article left. So I'll save that for next week. Okay. So let's do, um, we'll go ahead and do one more jury charge. Okay. How are we doing on time? Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll just do half of this jury charge. Okay. I'll read this at 200. The second count in the indictment is that a conspiracy and is based upon this portion of the statutory law, section 15, 11, 410. The crime known to the common law as conspiracy is hereby defined as a combination between two or more persons for the purpose of accomplishing a criminal or unlawful object or an object, neither criminal nor unlawful, by criminal or unlawful means. The crime of conspiracy is hereby declared to be a misdemeanor, and any person found guilty of the crime of conspiracy shall be sentenced to pay a fine of not more than $15,000 or to be in prison for not more than five years, provided that in no event shall a person who is convicted of the crime of conspiracy be given any greater fine or sentence than he would have received had he carried out the criminal or unlawful act contemplated by the conspiracy and had he been convicted of the criminal or unlawful act contemplated by the conspiracy or had he been convicted of the criminal or unlawful acts by which the conspiracy was to be carried out or effective. Mr. Foreman, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that is now the law on which the indictments in this case are based upon. Now, with regard to the conspiracy charge, I charge you as follows. The word conspire is defined substantially as follows. If two or more persons agree, acting upon a common purpose to commit a criminal act, they conspire. A conspiracy is a combination between two or more persons to do an unlawful act or to do a lawful act by criminal or unlawful means. There can be no conspiracy when one individual acts by or for himself only. In order to become a party to a conspiracy, a person must combine with some other person or someone else to effect the object of the conspiracy by means agreed upon. A mere mental purpose cannot justify a conviction of conspiracy. A common design is of the essence of the charge. Now, in order to establish conspiracy, it is necessary first that the conspiracy or agreement to commit the offense alleged in the indictment be established, and second, to prove further that one or more of the parties engaging in the conspiracy have committed some act to effect its object. If the conspiracy is established, proof of the doing of one overt act charged is necessary and sufficient to warrant a verdict of guilty. Now, to constitute conspiracy, it is not necessary that two or more persons should meet and enter into and express a formal agreement for the doing of the unlawful act, or that they should direct it by words or in writing, state between themselves or otherwise what the unlawful object is to be, or the details thereof, or the means by which the unlawful combination is to be made effective. It is sufficient that two or more persons in any manner, or through any contrivance positively or tactically come to a mutual understanding to accomplish a common and unlawful design. In other words, when an unlawful end is sought to be effective and two or more persons actuated by the common purpose of accomplishing that end work together in any way to further the unlawful scheme, each of such persons becomes a member of the conspiracy. The success or failure of the conspiracy is immaterial but before any person can be found guilty of the charge, it must appear beyond a reasonable doubt that a conspiracy was formed as alleged in the indictment and that the particular person was an active party to it. And under the charges here made, the conspiracy constitutes the offense. It must be made to appear from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt before a defendant can be convicted that he was a party to the conspiracy and unlawful agreement charged that he continued to be such up to the time that one overt act was committed. The mere fact that the defendant named may have been engaged in the performance of any of the acts charged in the indictment as overt acts would not authorize a conviction 
by reason of that act alone. It is necessary to show that such defendant was a party to the conspiracy and the unlawful agreement before his guilt of the offense charged is made out. Each party to a conspiracy must, must be actuated by an intent to promote the common design. If persons pursue by their acts the same unlawful object, one performing one act and another performing another act, all with a view to the attainment of the object that they are pursuing, the conclusion is warranted that they are engaged in a conspiracy to effect that object. Cooperation in some form must be shown. There must be intentional participation in the transaction with a view and purpose to further the common design. If a person understanding the unlawful character of the transaction encourages, advises, or in any manner with a purpose to forward the enterprise or scheme, assist in its prosecution, he becomes a conspirator. Joint assent and participation in the conspiracy may be found like any other fact as an inference from facts proven. When a conspiracy is in operation, a person joining in at any time thereafter assumes responsibility for all that was previously done by any party thereto, provided only that the new party had knowledge of the facts that such conspiracy is in operation and that he joins it knowingly. The evidence and proof of the conspiracy may be circumstantial. If this is the case, it is not only necessary that all the circumstances concur to show the existence of the conspiracy, but such circumstantial evidence must be consistent with any other reasonable or rational conclusion. Now the term overt act is used in these instructions is meant an act committed by one or more of the conspirators. If the evidence shows there, in fact, was a conspiracy which was intended to and had a tendency to follow the purpose of the conspiracy, such acts may be in agreement between two or more of the conspirators or it may be an act performed by any one of the conspirators. All right, I went ahead and read the whole thing because I know you're gonna be taking your RPR jury charge next week. So I thought, ah, I'll just read the whole thing. All right, let's do some Q&A. And I'll start this at 200. Get my box. All right, looks like plaintiff, no, excuse me, defense is questioning. Here we go. This is the dog bite. Do you know who opened that door? No. Was the door that opens on the side, was that on the driver's side or the passenger side? Driver's side. The driver's side? No, the passenger's side. And when the van stopped, was the passenger's side close to you or was it on the other side of the car? It was on the other side of the car. So when the dogs, when the light brown dog with the dark brown spots let go of you, it went around to the other side of the van? Yes. Was it down to Mr. Stahl's house where all the other dogs were? I don't know. Did you ever ride your bicycle down there? No. Did you ever walk down there? No. Earlier you said that you'd seen dogs there, right? Yes. Okay, had you ever seen them when your folks drove you by in the car? No, I saw them when I was at my friend's house. How did you get to your friend's house? I just went across the street on the other side of the dirt road. And you looked down there? Yes, excuse me, does anybody mind if we just take a short break? Unfortunately, the copy has gotten to me. Okay, Daniel, I'm going to show Mr. Palago four photographs and he's going to show them to you, okay? I just want you to look at them for a minute, and then I'll ask you some questions about the photographs, okay? Okay, all right, go ahead, counsel. Thank you, Daniel. I'm going to just explain here. There's two photographs here marked A and B. Well, there's also two more, C and D. Yes, that's right. I'm going to let him ask you some questions about these photographs, that's okay, I will go ahead and ask you the questions, but take your time, look them over with your attorney, you know, you go ahead and take your time. Yes, let's look them over. Okay, go ahead, counsel. Just look at the photos for a minute. Okay, all right, now go ahead and spread them out in front of you, okay? Now you've got four photographs there, is that right? Yes, and all four of them have dogs in them. 
one of them in each of the four photographs? Yes. Okay, are any of those dogs your dog, Max? Yes, this one. Okay, now you've just pointed to the A, is that correct? Yes, so you think that might be Max? Yes, that is your dog, yes. Does it look like Max? Yes, okay, do you know who the man is in the picture? No, okay, now I'd like you for, I would like for you to look at A, B, C, and D. Were any of those dogs the dog that bit you? Yes, which one? It was one of those, it was that one. The one in photograph B? Uh-huh. Is that a yes? Yes. Please make sure you say yes or no, okay? Okay. Now, have you ever seen the photographs here of C and D? You mean the dog? Thank you. Yes, the dog? Yes, the dog. No, I haven't. Have you ever seen this dog before? No. Now, your counsel is pointing to photograph D. No. Now, the one that bit you, is that the one? Yes. Okay, now the other dog that didn't bite you, is it in any of these photographs? Yes. Which one? That one. So the dog that did not bite you was in photograph D. Yes. Okay, now is the dog in photograph D the one that stayed across the street? Yes. Okay, I'm going to show you two more photographs, E and F. Let's let your counsel look at them, and then I will hand them to you. Thank you. Go ahead. Is that someone's house in photographs E and F? Yes. Whose house is that? That is mine. Was that the house you were living in at the time that this happened? Yes. Now, I'd like for you to look at photograph E. Can you tell me where you tried to climb over the fence? Can you show that to me? It was over there. Okay, now over on the left side of the photograph? Yes. Behind this little tree? Yes. Okay, I'm going to show you photograph F. Where you tried to climb is opposite the driveway from F? Yes. I think you're getting him confused. Do you have any other pictures that would show the other side of the driveway? Unfortunately, I don't. Let me ask the question a little bit differently. Is F where you go from the driveway into the front door? Yes. Is that the side you tried to climb? No. So you tried to climb the other side? Yes. Let's look at photograph E for a little bit. When the dog that bit you was barking at Max and Lace, uh-huh, were Max and Lace over to the right side? On this side. They were on the left side of the photograph E? Yes. So over here by this telephone pole on the left edge of photograph E? No, they were down more. Down the street more? Yes. Okay, but they were in the yard that's on the, yes, left side of photograph E? Yes. Do you know who Cheryl Thompson is? No. Do you know who Fred Thompson is? No. Have you ever talked with people by those names? No. When's the first time you have ever heard the names Fred Thomas and Cheryl Tom Thompson? I'm sorry. Fred Thompson and Cheryl Thompson. I never have. Until right now? Yes. Before this dog bite thing happened, did you ever talk to Mr. or Mrs. Thompson about the dogs? No. Before this di dog bite happened, did you ever talk to Mr. and Mrs. Stahl? No. About the dogs? No. Mr. and Mrs. Stahl are the people that lived down the street and had all of the dogs? No. Have you ever heard the name Kyle Waters? No. Have you ever heard the names Amy Waters, Mrs. Waters? Yes. Where did you hear that name? When my friend used to talk to her. Okay, do you know where Mrs. Waters lives? No. Did your friend talk to Mrs. Waters or Mrs. Stahl? Mrs. Waters, but you had never talked to Mrs. Waters? No. Tell me a little bit about Max. Was he a mean dog? No. Were you afraid of Max? No. Let me ask you this. After you got bit, were you afraid of Max? No. What about Lace? Were you afraid of Lace after you got bit? No. And Honey, were you afraid of Honey after you got bit? Yes. Okay, why were you afraid of Honey after you got bit? I don't know. Did Honey ever growl at you? No. How many dogs do you have now? Four. What are the dogs' names? Lace, Chubby, Leather, and Honey. Is Chubby one of Honey's puppies? Yeah. And is Leather one of Honey's puppies? Yes. Is Chubby a boy girl, a boy dog, or a girl dog? Boy. What about Leather, boy or girl? Boy. How old is Chubby now? I don't know. How old is Leather now? I don't know. Of the four, which one is the biggest? Chubby. Is Chubby bigger than Max was? No. 
are any of the dogs lace chubby leather and honey as big as max was no are you afraid of chubby no are you afraid of leather no are you afraid of honey now no are you afraid of lace now no now for a while you were afraid of honey uh-huh is that a yes yes okay when was that after the dog bite was that just for a week or for how long? For a couple of months. Then you weren't afraid of her anymore? No. Did you have to quit playing baseball that summer after this accident? No, I couldn't play until I could start walking, until I could start walking again. Well, how long was it until you could walk again? About two weeks. And when you started being able to walk again, did you go back to playing baseball? Yes, I just couldn't run as fast. Were you still on the all-star team? Yes. Did you get to play? Only sometimes. What position did you play after the dog bite? Right field. Did you get to bat? Yes, sometimes. And how long did you get to play baseball? All summer long? Yes. Until when? Until, I don't know. When Chad ran toward the house, was it Chad who ran toward the house? Yes. Did he run across the driveway from the left side of the photograph E toward the middle of photograph E? No, he ran straight into the garage. The garage was open, and he just ran straight into the house. Do you know what obedience training is for a dog? No. Do you know if Max ever had any obedience training? No. You don't know or he did not? I don't know. What about Honey? Do you know if Honey had any obedience training? I don't know. Did Lace? I don't know. Did Chubby? I don't know. Did Leather? I don't know. Okay, have you ever had any nightmares or dreams about this? Yes. When was that? when I was still in the cast. What were those dreams and nightmares like? Really bad. How long were you in the cast? For about two weeks. Can you tell me about those dreams? I don't really remember. It was about the dog. Did the dreams go away after you were out of the cast? Yeah. Did the dreams go away after you started playing baseball? Yes. Did they ever come back? They used to, but not anymore. What do you mean by that? Like a couple of days, like, I wouldn't have them for a couple of days, and then they would come back for a couple of days, and then I wouldn't have them for a couple of days. When was the last time you had a dream about this? It was last year, 2007. Okay, now do you know when last year was, before or after you moved to Texas? Before. So you quit having dreams before you moved to Texas? Yes. Can you tell me anything about the dreams? No. Did you dream you were getting bit or did you dream something else? I dreamed of me getting bit. Do you have any relatives who live near you in Texas? Yes. What relatives? My dad, my stepdad's parents, my stepdad's mom and grandma. Have you made friends in Texas? Yes. Good friends? Yes. Who is your best friend in Texas? Tammy. Tammy? Yeah. Is that a boy or a girl? It's a girl. What's Tammy's last name? Brick. Did you play baseball in Texas? No, not yet. All right, how are you doing in school? Do you like school in Texas? Just a little. Which school did you like better, the one in California or the one in Texas? The one in California. Why is that? I don't know, I had more friends. Are you a good student? Yes. You get lots of A's and B's? No. What kind of grades do you get? I don't know. Do you have any other family in Texas besides your stepfather's mother and grandmother and your stepdad and your mom and your two brothers? Yes. What other family do you have in Texas? Cousins. What cousins? Are they your stepdad's cousins or your mom's or your dad's? I don't know. So there's some cousins there too? Yeah. Before this dog bite thing happened, had anyone ever warned you about the light brown dog with the dark brown spots? No. Before the dog bite thing happened, had anyone ever warned you about the other dog? No. After the dog finally let go of your leg, what did you do? I ran into the house. What did you do once you got into the house? I jumped on the floor. Was that in the kitchen? No, in the family room. Then what did you do? I just laid there and then this guy across the street came over and he tied a towel around my leg. Where was your mom? In the kitchen. Her and my sister were screaming and she got on her phone and dialed 911. Then when you dropped to the floor, could you feel your leg? Yes, it hurt really bad. What did your leg feel like? It felt like there was nothing there, but it also hurt. When you started playing baseball again, could you slide into base? No. Could you jump for a ball or dive for a ball? Just a little. 
So you dropped on the floor and somebody, a man came over and put a towel on your leg? Yes. Do you know who that man was? No. Can you tell me what he looked like? Uh-uh. What's your sister's name? Jody. Is she older or younger? Older. How old is Jody? 14. She's 14 now? Yes. Did the man say anything when he put the towel on your leg? No. Was your leg bleeding? Yes, really bad. There was a piece of skin, a chunk missing out of it. Had you ever seen that man before? Yes. Do you know where he lives? Across? No. I don't know where he lives now. He used to live across the street. Who did he live with? My mom. Say that again? What? The man who put the towel on your leg, he used to live across the street? Yes. Do you know who he lived with? No. Do you know what his last name was? No. Do you remember the man saying anything to you? No. He just put the towel on your leg and then what did he do? I can't remember. Did he say there was, did he stay there until an ambulance came? Yes. Did an ambulance take you someplace? Yes. Where did the ambulance take you? To a hospital. All right. We'll go ahead and do one page read back, okay? So um, that was a great example of somebody saying something that clearly was wrong. And so the reporter put in parentheses SIC, like said in context, when the boy said, um, or the question was, who did he live with? Talking about that neighbor. And he says, my mom. Uh, clearly, that's not true. But um, he just, the witness misunderstood the question. So in parentheses, the, the reporter put SIC, meaning, you know, you're just letting the person who's reading this know, I didn't write this down incorrectly. They, it was actually said. So you can do that for like obvious, you know, responses where, or even questions where it's very obvious that it's incorrect. But if they don't, if they don't correct themselves, you can always put SIC, meaning, you know, that that's what they said. So I had that happen to me once at a deposition. This man kept referring to um, his uh, health insurance as an HMO, but in the beginning of the depot, it was a PPO. So at the end of it, I when it was over, I said, did you, you know, you kept saying HMO and the attorney wasn't catching on to it either. And he goes, oh my gosh, no, I meant PPO. Um, you know, and he, but, but he, you know, it was like he was saying the wrong one. So anyways, I just put SIC in parentheses because I didn't want them to think that I wrote it incorrectly, but he actually said it. So you're writing what they're saying, but you're just kind of clarifying, like, this is what they said, you know? So you can do that with names. If they call somebody the wrong name and you know that that's a mistake and they don't catch it, just put SIC in parentheses or locations. Okay, so let's do some um, q and I'm going to read this one page at 180, 200, 225. Um, you're going to hear cameraman, photography, directly, quantity, special, effects, direction, Mr. Roberts. You're going to hear camera, right-hand side, initial R, final N, D, Z. Wait a minute, W, A, M, T. How far? I don't remember. Mr. Sanders, vicinity, operating, appreciate. That's about, that's about it for the, oh, belonging. Okay, this is plaintiff. First time at 180, here we go. There were two cameras there, right? One was a camera belonging to the special effects people, that's right, which was under the direction of Mr. Roberts. He was operating the camera. He was the director of photography for that camera. Mr. Roberts was the operating cameraman of that camera for the special effects department, that's right. Now, was your camera being used in any way? No. Where was your cameraman and your camera located at the time that these trips were being made. Wait a minute, you said, where was my cameraman? You had a cameraman, operative cameraman? Yes, but he wasn't operating. I appreciate that, but where was he? I don't recall where he was. Where were you? I was sitting in back of the camera on the right-hand side. Where was Mr. Sanders? 
I don't remember. He was in the vicinity. How far from him were you? I was on the other side. I was just a little bit off center of the camera. I wasn't directly in back of the camera. I was to the right so that I could see what was going on. All right, so we'll do it again at 200. Here we go. There were two cameras there, right? One was a camera belonging to the special effects people, that's right, which was under the direction of Mr. Roberts. He was operating the camera. He was the director of photography for that camera. Mr. Roberts was the operating cameraman of that camera for the special effects department. That's right. Now, was your camera being used in any way? No. Where was your cameraman and your camera located at the time that these trips were being made? Wait a minute. You said, where was my cameraman? You had a cameraman, operative cameraman? Yes, but he wasn't operating. I appreciate that, but where was he? I don't recall where he was. Where were you? I was sitting in back of the camera on the right-hand side. Where was Mr. Sanders? I don't remember. He was in the vicinity. How far from him were you? I was on the other side. I was just a little bit off center of the camera. I wasn't directly in back of the camera. I was to the right so that I could see what was going on. All right, so I'll do last time at 225. There were two cameras there, right. One was a camera belonging to the special effects people, that's right, which was under the direction of Mr. Roberts. He was operating the camera. He was the director of photography for that camera. Mr. Roberts was the operating cameraman of that camera for the special effects department. That's right. Now, was your camera being used in any way? No. Where was your cameraman and your camera located at the time that these trips were being made? Wait a minute. You said, where was my cameraman? You had a cameraman, operative cameraman? Yes, but he wasn't operating. I appreciate that, but where was he? I don't recall where he was. Where were you? I was sitting in back of the camera on the right-hand side. Where was Mr. Sanders? I don't remember. He was in the vicinity. How far from him were you? I was on the other side. I was just a little bit off center of the camera. I wasn't directly in back of the camera. I was to the right so that I could see what was going on. All right. So we'll read that back. And if you want, we can each take a Q and an A. You have one that was better than another? Yeah, the first one. <laughs> the first one, yeah. That was, that was tough to read. So I always know if it's tough to read. I think it's the cameraman thing. And operative. Yeah. I'm writing these down real quick. Cameraman. <laughs> yeah. And then camera. Operative cameraman. Okay. You want me to start or do you want to start? Yeah, I'll start. Okay. Okay. So question. There were two cameras there. Answer right. Question, one was a camera belonging to the special effects people? Answer, that's right. Question, which was under the direction of Mr. Roberts? Answer, he was operating the camera, period. He was the director of photography for that camera. Question, Mr. Roberts was the operating cameraman of that camera for the special effects department? Answer, that's right. Perfect question. Now, was your camera being used in any way? Answer, no. Question, where was your camera? Uh, wait, oh man, where was your cameraman and your camera located? at the time that these trips were being made? Answer, wait a minute, you said, where was my cameraman? Question, you had a cameraman, comma, operative cameraman? 
answer yes, but he wasn't operating. Question, I appreciate that, but where was he? Answer, I don't recall where he was. Question, where were you? Answer, I was sitting in back of the camera on the right hand side. Question, where was Mr. Sanders? Answer, I don't remember. He was in the vicinity. Question, how far from him were you? Answer, I was on the other side. I was just a little bit off center of the camera. I wasn't directly in back of the camera. I was to the right so that I could see what was going on. How'd you do? Seemed like you did great. Yeah, I did good on that one. Good, awesome. Never as bad as you think, you know? Yeah, just uh, need to work on hitting those accurately because I misstroked a couple times on camera even, and that's really not a hard word. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Well, great job. All right, well, what, um, I know I asked you this again, but I want to I wanna write it down. When is your, what day is your RPR? Is it Monday? Thursday. Thursday, okay. Thursday, RPR. All right, I'll be thinking of you, but maybe I'll get to see you before then. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll see you the night for sh well, I'm going to try to go to all the mid speed and high speed classes. So Very I'll good. see potentially, well, no, Wednesday morning I can't, but so I'll see you in two classes next week before then, before Perfect. my And Yay. then I'll see you on Friday morning to let you know how it went. Yay, yes, <laughs> that's right. I'll be texting you going, how did you do? <laughs> Um, yeah, and I, I know this doesn't apply to you, but we're moving the low, lower speeds Monday night class to Monday morning because I'm going to be doing a live theory class on Monday evenings. So, but I know that doesn't affect you. So, um, how's the theory going? Good. Yeah. It's completely, the lessons are completely recorded. So that Monday evening class will just be a live Q and a for any students that want to go in and ask questions. So the whole theory will be completely recorded. So they'll watch all their lessons um, and read back will all be recorded, but then we'll have one live class a week for any questions that students may have. So we've already got quite a few signed up. It's pretty exciting. Really, I know somebody who's doing, I'm sure you've heard of that A to Z program. That N, have you heard of that, that NCRA is doing? Yes. I know someone who's doing that right now. So it's just an introduction to the machine, basically. And so when he's done with that, I thought this would be a good option for him because he works full time and- Yes. Um, it's so, you can't beat the price either. I mean, I know $150 a month for theory. I it's, it's just amazing. Is it, um, is it the same theory that you, you taught at Sage? Yep. And we changed it all to where every, we, the students don't have to make changes. I mean, it's all real time, you know, compatible. So I don't, I remember how I used to have to say, Oh, change this. And we're changing that. It's not like that anymore. It's all been, modified and I have my book, my cross out. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So, and the nice thing about it is the students are not having to buy a book. It, Robert has it all in handout format. So all they have to do is print it out. I mean, you, you couldn't ask for a, I mean, a more, a cheaper way to do it, you know? Are they turning stuff in ever or, or are they yeah. self grading or? Yeah, they are self grading, but they have to turn in their, you know, they have to do it at least three times, preferably four, but then they have to turn it in to show that they did it. So mm -hmm. we, you know, kind of look it over to make sure they did it, but they do self grade it. They do go back and listen to the readback and kind of compare, but then we do have tests. So it's just like, you know, we went after every five lessons and I dictate the test, then they go back in and grade it, but then they're going to, they're going to submit their notes and their transcript to show that they did it so you know it's a lot of it is self graded but 
you know, like I've told them, if you, you know, if you're not being honest with yourself, you're only cheating yourself, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it's, and it, you know, the, I mean, students have to have somewhat of discipline, uh, otherwise it's not going to work. And I know some people are like, well, I have to go to an actual school. I can't, I don't have the discipline to do online. So I know it's not for everyone, you know? Yeah. Those that have jobs and families and they don't have time to, or they don't have a school around them. I think the closest one to us now is Orange County. So, you know, it, it works for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, so. I'll, um, I'll let him know about it. And, um, it's yes. nice cause you can, you can jump in anytime, right? Anytime you can do it yeah. at two in the morning if you want. And that's the thing too. It's self-paced. So they can do as many as two lessons a week, but if they need to just do one lesson a week because they're too busy or if they can't do any that week, it's, it's totally up to them. Hmm. So there's 40 lessons. They can do two a week. So, you know, it will take, uh, what is that? 20 weeks. Yeah. So, um, well, that's cool. Yeah. Exciting. Yep. It is. We're excited. So yeah, tell him he can go on the website, the platinum Steno website. It has information on there. He can email for information and, uh, either Robert or myself can give him, you know, all the information he needs. Then Robert also has a, uh, he's got a contract with, um, uh, case cat and eclipse. So you can choose what software you want. And then I, I just can't even believe the prices. It's amazing. Like a hundred dollars for a one-time fee for, I think that one is, uh, gosh, I don't want to misquote, but for one of them. And, uh, it's a deal they're doing for new theory students. So awesome. it is, it really is. Gosh, we need, we need, we need you guys, you know, we need this to happen because the options are getting more and more limited. And it's yep. like, well, here in Tennessee, there isn't one brick and mortar school. So not one. So you have to do it online in some yep. way. Yep. So yep. It's a good option. Yeah. And you're right. You can't beat the price. It's crazy. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's isn't insane. it? A as opposed to what you were paying before, 15 grand a year, you know, it, it's, yeah. but like Robert says, you know, he's got his own jobs and this is, he just wants to help the students. He's such a great guy. That's so neat. I'm, yep. you know, Better. get new, new blood in, right? Yep. Every, as often as possible because. Yeah. One of my good friends just started theory this week. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Yeah, she's so excited. I know. I'm excited for her. And oh, it had, it, had it been a different price, she wouldn't be able to f afford it, you know? So it's just, you know, she works full time. And so it's affordable for a lot of people. Which yeah. Is yeah. Very so. cool. Well, I'll um, let him know about it. And absolutely. Thank you. Hopefully he, uh, he loves the, what he's doing now. I know the program they're doing is like very basic. I think they're just going over the, the keyboard basically, you know, but it kind of gives people a taste. Yeah. And, like whether you, uh, whether or not you like it. And yeah. it's free. So it's kind of nice just yes. that people can just kind of dip their toe in the water and see if yeah. they're interested. But, um, it's awesome. Yeah. So, but I'll let him have a machine. Know. Huh? Does he have a machine? No, not yet. They, okay. They have um, machines that they lend them while they're doing the program. Okay. So they're able to just use it while they're there, basically. That's so. another thing Robert was able to, um, he got a deal with uh, Stenograph for new theory students. They're giving them a new, a new wave. And it's, uh, I wrote it down yesterday, $140. And it's, and then you make, if you, get their software, the case cat, then it's $40 a month. But if you don't want the software, then you pay, um, $30 a month. So you get for $140 down, you get a new wave student wave. And then you, you get, uh, you know, depending if you want 
the software or not. It's either 40 a month or 30 a month. You make the payments if you can't afford to go buy a machine, you know, or if you want a new. You're not renting it. It's you're buying it, but you're yeah, just it's, making installments. It's, yep. They call it rent to own. Oh, okay. Yeah. Rent to own is basically what it is. So 140 down and then depending on which software you pick, either 30 or 40 a month. Yeah. If you pick their software, it's 40 a month. If you don't want their software, then it's 30 a month. So they're giving you a great deal if you use their software, you know. Wow. That's, I think he'd be crazy not to do it if he's interested. Yeah, that's yeah. really bad. Yeah. And then so. like my girlfriend, my girlfriend found a great deal. I set her up with different groups on Facebook and she found a great deal on a machine. So she just wanted to buy one. So she, I think she spent like 500 bucks and bought a, you know, just a, a student machine that's going to get her through school. So she just wanted to put the money out there and, and own her. So everybody's different, you know? Uh, you know, that yeah. is, the, I mean, he could have my, I have my student machine too, and I'm not okay. using it anymore. I bought a machine. So, yeah. um, so see, really, yeah, he could use mine, but he might yeah. want his own. I think there's something kind of nice about having one that's like yours. I mean, yeah. I mean, he could have mine, but yeah. Yeah. I know I had a student machine as well. I gave it to someone that's uh, traveling down to uh, Orange County for school. And, uh, she just didn't, hers broke. She didn't have the money. So I had an extra student one. So I gave that to her. So, um, you know, you can find them out there for pretty cheap or people like people like us, like, Oh, go ahead and take mine, you know? Yeah. Yeah. My extra that I don't use. So yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Just let him know if he has any questions, feel free to email or there's a, uh, an 88800 number on the website. He can call that and it goes right to Robert. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, All right. thank you for the info. Yeah, you're welcome and have a great weekend and I will see you next week. Okay. See you then. Okay. Bye, Catherine. Bye.